Well, good afternoon, everyone. Got some people still coming in, which is great. So thank you for being here. I'm Kirby Lambert. I'm with the Outreach and Interpretation Program at, here at the Historical Society. Um, and it's our pleasure this afternoon to have Christine Brown, who is going to be talking about all the news that's not fit to print. Um, I know she has some good stories for us. Uh, hopefully, as you travel around Montana and around Helena, you've noticed our um, uh, his historic signs. And um, we have about 2,000 of those signs around the state, I believe. Almost. Almost 2,000 signs. And Ellen Baumler kind of got that program off to a start. She wrote a lot. Uh, Martha Cole, who's in the audience, has written a lot. And Christine Brown is the newest addition to our Sites and Signs staff. And so um, she's written a lot. And um, these are great. They're a great way to learn more about the places that you visit. And uh, one of the, I guess, drawbacks to these signs is they're very limited into the amount of text you can have at a, at a you know, on a sign, how much people are going to stand there and read. Um, so today we're going to hear some of the stories behind the stories. Uh, Christine is an interpretive historian here at the Montana Historical Society. She researches and writes about the Treasure State's notable properties for our National Register Sign, uh, National Register of Historic Places Sign Program. Uh, she also manages the Centennial Farm and Ranch Program for the Historical Society and the State of Montana. And if you haven't seen our brand new book on Montana's historic or Centennial Farms and Ranches, uh, check it out in the um, store. That's another project that really turned out great. She is the co-author with Cher Justo of Hand Raised, The Bards of Montana. She's a contributing author to um, The History of Montana and 101 Objects, which came out earlier this year, and also kind of the force behind a sequel to that book, which is The History of Montana in 101 Places that will be coming out. Um, well, we're not actually putting a date on Sometime. it just yet, but soon, soon, like in the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my pleasure to give you Christine Brown. Thank you, Kirby. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Great. All right. As Kirby said, I am the newest addition to the sites and the outreach and interpretation um, uh, department and since 2019 I have been very lucky to be able to write um, national register signs um, but before that I was um, working for preserve Montana or Montana Preservation Alliance um, for about 15 years so I was used to writing sort of short snappy text to promote historic preservation but um, I didn't really realize how, how hard it was going to be to cram the history of an entire building, sometimes over 100 years, um, into 190 eighth grade reading level words. Um, but as it turns out, after a few signs, I, I got pretty good at it. And uh, making, making the story short um, uh, isn't so hard. But the, the hardest part is that with every sign I write, I'm always having to leave out some really juicy, really intriguing, often macabre, um, very sad stories. Um, but still, they're stories of Montana, Montana history, and people's stories, too. And it's really hard to just leave them in my computer, never, ever to see the, <laughs> the light of day again. So I'm here today to tell you a little bit, a few of those stories um, that I found, and um, some of them are um, very sad, some of them um, uh, not so sad, some of them just really interesting uh, stories that some people may not have heard before or thought about before. But um, uh, Kirby gave away some of my presentation. Um, since 1990, we've um, written, uh, actually about 1,800 signs statewide. That doesn't mean that you could go out and count them all. Some of them have disappeared or never been put up or something like that. But we have written over 1,800 signs for the program. And our program is um, 
it is unique to most, uh, uh, compared to most other sign programs across uh, the states. Um, our signs offer some information. They offer text, they offer history of the property, whereas I, I travel around and see big bronze signs that just say National Register or Historic Landmark 1915 or 1925, which doesn't give you too much um, information, but ours attract tourists to uh, read about a building, learn something. I think if you can, if you go to a town and, and you read even one of these signs, you know a lot more about that place than when you uh, first got there. Um, and our program is uh, unique also in that it's a screaming deal for homeowners um, and property owners. Um, in other states, the, uh, the onus is on the owner to pay for one of the signs, and I've compared um, what the programs are like in other states, and sometimes it's um, 1000 to $2,000 for some of the larger signs, those big bronze signs that some of the states use. But in Montana, um, we are lucky to have a small portion of the bed tax, the accommodations tax that funds our program and pretty much pays for all of the signs. And um, homeowners in Montana pay $35 for the smaller signs that are in historic districts. And then those larger signs on some of the individually listed uh, properties are only $55. And I don't think that price has changed in a really long time, maybe <laughs> 30 years. So it's great, it's a great program. Um, and the other thing we added a few years ago in 2017, just so you know, if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about um, uh, all of these properties that we've written about, is that they're all on Historic Montana, historicmt.org, if you want to visit the site. Um, uh, and in addition to the sign text, uh, you can look at um, then and now photos. You can link to the National Register nomination if you really want to get deep into the property's history. Um, and sometimes there, um, we do have audio stories and um, the occasional video uh, link would be in there too. So it's a great resource um, and I, I um, uh, encourage you to check it out. Um, and you might be thinking, well, all this extra information, all this sign text that doesn't fit, why don't we put it up on the website? And that's a great idea and something I would like to do, um, but all of that is time consuming and um, right now we're busy enough with uh, writing the signs and getting them uh, uploaded to Historic Montana in a timely manner. But someday that would be great if we could upload PDFs of news clippings and other um, research that we find. So for each sign that uh, we write, we start usually with the National Register nomination and um, or a property inventory form. And sometimes these documents are wonderful. They have everything I ever wanted to know about the property and I can just whip out a sign in a few hours. Other times they're not so great. They're very short and they're very vague um, and they don't um, give me enough information to uh, write a sign of any length. So um, then I do some more research and in the past 10 years digital resources have really just made life for historians so much better. And so um, resources like um, newspapers.com, uh, Montana newspapers, and Chronicling America through the Library of Congress um, are what um, are actually my problem. If I, if I didn't have those resources, I wouldn't find all of these extra juicy details that I, that I, haven't, that I don't get to include in the signs. Um, and generally, um, all of the, the, the subjects I'll talk about today fall into two categories, the sad and the gruesome and the just plain interesting. Um, and you can see all the different uh, um, subjects I always, almost always have to leave out. So let's start over in Butte. Um, any Butte natives here? Maybe, no, my goodness. Um, well, this is the Stevens Block. It's on the corner of Park in Montana in Uptown Butte. You've probably walked or driven by it dozens of times if you visited Butte. And I had so much fun writing this sign because around every corner, I just found another gruesome story. Um, and I just, I'm not even telling you all of them today. I just picked a, a selection, but I'll paraphrase um, what I wrote on the sign. 
Um, successful Irish immigrant Frank Stevens built this Queen Anne style um, boarding house and commercial block in 1891. He chose the lot uh, because the, the basement had already been dug and he paid $499 for it. Um, and of course, it's a wonderful Queen Anne building and that, with that corner turret and it had tall plate glass windows on the commercial level um, and uh, decorative cast iron details, beautiful building. Um, and it held 32 rooms and the Stevens family, they operated it as a boarding house and apartments for decades. And the upper floors actually today remain in near original condition. They've, they were abandoned for use many years ago. And um, so the second and third floors still just have one bathroom, one toilet and one sink room, not even a full bathroom together per floor, just like they did in the, at the turn of the century. Um, so the, the building included Ludi's Grocers um, on the ground floor, which was one of Butte's first self-serve grocery stores back when you, most people were used to asking for every item that they needed from the clerk. Um, and below the sidewalk, Joseph Richards, the undertaker, operated um, Butte's first undertaking business in, uh, until 1908. Um, and when Frank Stevens died uh, in 1898, he was laid in state in the hall at the top of the first flight of stairs. So an interesting history, for sure. Um, there was a lot to fit in there. Um, but the owner of the building asked me not to include all of the details I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> so first, you know, the Stevens family did, they lived in the building. Um, I think on the top floor, they had apartments in the top floor, and they were a witness to all of these um, interesting things that happened. Um, in 1894, Georgia Thompson, a young girl uh, who was living in the, the building with a married couple, um, disappeared. Um, a search, they called the police, the, the police came and they searched, they didn't find the girl. Um, but the news article hints that her birth mother took her back and the, you can see in the subtitle title it says, and it was possibly a godsend to it. Strange. Um, and also in 1894, just a few days after the girl disappeared, a woman tried to commit suicide. Um, the snarky article, uh, the journalist who wrote it said, a young woman whose name is not Maud Jackson or who is not the only daughter of a rich Eastern banker or a Southern planter drank poison in the Stevens block. And apparently it was related to uh, um, her boyfriend giving her the cold, so the, the cold shoulder. And the reporter mockingly suggests that the rebuff may have been too much for her delicate con constitution. Fortunately, a physician was able to revive her. She was okay. Um, and this is just one of the first incidents of attempted suicide um, at this building. Um, also in 1894, Rufus Jones and his wife Frankie, who was pregnant and had one arm, the article notes, they distracted a clerk in the Hughes grocery store, which was on the ground floor on the corner. They distracted the clerk asking to see hams that were stored in the basement, but the clerk figured it out, figured out the heist, and he headed off Rufus, who pulled out his revolver. The two, the clerk and Rufus wrestled and um, luckily the gun did not go off and Rufus ran away um, and he was later found um, in a cabin down the street and he got three years for that incident. Um, in 1895 in March, uh, an embezzler who had embezzled money in Salt Lake City, Henry Simons, he was found hiding out in the Stevens block. He was waiting for a good time to uh, flee to Canada one day after the embezzler was located, a runaway horse smashed into the grocery store window. I'm not sure if it was the same Hughes grocery store that got robbed a year before. They didn't um, specify. But um, the article mentions that the, uh, the window was valued at $100, but doesn't mention if the horse or the driver were injured or killed. <laughs> In September 1896, another suicide, Ethel Noyes, tried to commit suicide by taking six grains of morphine. Once again, she was saved by a physician when he pumped her stomach, and hours later, she left the building. In August 1899, according to the Montana Standard, Ella Keys, a boarder at the hotel, reportedly was rebuffed by a male neighbor friend 
when she invited him to live with her. Not acceptable. She was a, because she was a divorced woman. Um, and the article goes on to say she begged many times and threatened suicide and finally drank a vial of carbolic acid to show her seriousness. Uh, now, carbolic acid is a um, highly poisonous um, liquid that comes from coal tar. Not, not very good, very uh, poisonous if you ingest it or even inhale it. But once again, Ella did not swallow a fatal dose and she survived the incidents. Um, these sensational reports um, were kind of like, uh, if you're familiar, familiar with clickbait or things that the newspaper wants you to click on these days because it's uh, sensational and gets um, readership. Um, but the, the, so I, I come across a lot of articles about women's suicide and um, they, these articles reinforce Victorian era notions of women's proper behavior and basically we're sending the message that if you weren't married or with a man in marriage um, that you were, you might as well commit suicide. <laughs> and one more hits close to home. Uh, the next incident was 1899. Um, David Dyer, um, Anaconda Company carpenter, uh, was sent to the pest house with smallpox. Uh, the physician who uh, examined him the week before said he did not have smallpox. Um, but then a week later, he was broken out in so sores, and um, the county physician quarantined the whole building. Uh, but the <laughs> newspaper article at the end notes that um, by the end of the day after the quarantine was official, most residents had removed to other quarters. <laughs> Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to quarantine a building if everyone's just going to go take their uh, exposure somewhere else. So I thought that was interesting. So um, this is the Stevens Block today. It's um, a lovely building. The owner's done a great job restoring it and um, putting up uh, the National Register sign. Um, but when I originally sent her the first draft of the sign, I did mention the suicides and the horse crashing through the window and I think maybe the robbery. Just very generally, I mentioned those in one sentence and she asked me to take it out. So um, that's... Um, pretty common. People don't want the sordid details of their building um, emblazoned on the front of it. So, all right. Next, we're going to stay in Butte for a minute. Um, I re very recently wrote this sign for 1212 East 2nd Street. In fact, the owner has not approved it yet. Um, the owner was not happy with my first draft that told some of the truth. Um, it's an unassuming little late 1890s worker cottage on Butte's south side. Um, and it, this house is just bursting at the seams with interesting stories. When I started digging into the, the newspaper archives, I was pretty happy to find out that it was the, par the first parish house um, for St. Joseph's Catholic Church. And the church originally was located next door. It's not there now, but this was sort of you know, the origin story of St. Joseph, Joseph's Catholic Church in Butte. And so from 1902 to 1906, um, uh, three different priests lived there. But then I was even more delighted to find that the next occupant, Art Dancero and his family, um, Art and Laura Dancero, I think they had four kids. Um, Art was making oyster cocktail in the backyard in a shed. And I thought, well, what is oyster cocktail? Um, it turns out that oyster cocktail was the forerunner to shrimp cocktail, which we all know and love. Um, Art didn't invent oyster cocktail. Um, it was uh, um, a delicacy, I think, that originated, I, I had to look in a <coughs> culinary history book, uh, originated on the West Coast. But Art was importing oysters from Baltimore, and he would bottle them up in a tangy tomato, Tabasco, and Worcestershire sauce mixture, which we all know is cocktail sauce. Um, and he sold them, he canned them, and he sold them in local bars. And especially at Christmas time, they were um, kind of considered a Christmas uh, treat. And even when I was growing up, we always had oysters at Christmas time. 
And that's because things like shrimp in the early, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, you couldn't ship shrimp across the country. It would spoil, but oysters unshucked they, and shipped in the winter in the cold, they would keep for about two weeks. So that's what people were eating as a treat before shrimp cocktail. But that's not all. <laughs> so art, I thought Art Dancero and his oyster cocktail was really interesting, so I looked further to see when Art moved out and the family moved out. Turns out that Art was shot and killed by his wife in 1917. Um, they did not have a great relationship and he had ab been abusing her for many years since they were married and during an argument she shot him and the police found him dead at the foot of the stairs. Um, and then, um, you know, investigation followed and um, Laura, <clears throat> his wife, was actually acquitted, um, but the doctors did uh, confirm m many uh, signs of abuse on her body. Um, there you go. And there's one more. Did they both come up? She was uh, acquitted uh, for the homicide, although she did not fare well, as many women in this situation would not. Um, her in-laws actually lived behind the house in a cottage on the same lot, and they um, got custody of her children, and she was forced to move um, to an apartment uptown, and she took a job as a maid but she was still required to support the children. There were court documents um, uh, requiring her to pay child support even back then. Um, she eventually married again and divorced again on grounds of cruelty. Um, but it looks like by 1940, things were looking up and um, of course she didn't live in this house anymore, but she did uh, make amends with her mother-in-law. She was living with her mother-in-law whose son she shot. Um, by 1940, and when um, she died, she was living with her son. So she did keep her relationships with her family. Just um, one of those interesting stories that would never come out on the side, but sign, but an interesting story of a woman's life in the early 1900s. Um, other women's stories come up all the time, and I can't go into much detail on the signs. I really loved and love to read about women landlords um, in Montana history. They were quite common. I mean, um, a, a, many women uh, for a source of income um, would run boarding houses or just rent a room in their house, and that would bring in some extra money. And many widows relied on this income. Um, but when I wrote, wrote the sign for the Morse Palace block on Main Street in Anaconda, I uncovered two interesting sisters who came to own major properties in both Butte and in Anaconda, Anaconda mostly, but also in Butte. Um, they uh, came here, they came to Montana with their husbands um, in the 1890s when Anaconda was just booming because of the smelter. They came from Wales. Um, their husbands at first ran the Metropolitan Cafe and um, ran, and the um, Margaret and Mary Volenweider they ran a boarding house, and it was not just a little boarding house, it was a 50-room boarding house next door to this Metropolitan Cafe. Um, Margaret, um, in 1906, Margaret was in a terrible accident. She was walking by an unfinished building that was under construction, and uh, a steel I-beam blew off of the building and hit her and severed her foot. Um, she sued the owner, um, and it took five years to settle the case, but she did get a settlement. I was never sure how much money she got, but the year after the case was settled, she and her sister um, constructed this building, the Morse Palace Block, um, which was architect designed by a, a, a very respected architect, architect in um, uh, Butte and Anaconda named Joseph White. So in partnership with another uh, man, Thomas Silha, they um, built the building, which was $20,000 at the time, and um, Silha ran the commercial space on the lower floors, and Mary and Margaret um, rented out the rooms upstairs. And um, the sign talks about the different, I had to include in the sign, the different owners, the different um, businesses that were 
cycling through the lower floors. And so there wasn't much detail, much um, space to talk about the other, the, um, the sisters. So they managed, um, they managed the boarding house at the Morse Palace block, but at the same time, they also acquired many other homes in Anaconda, and they eventually took over management of the Morse Palace block. Um, their husbands had died by the 1920s, they were widows, and so they um, had ownership of all these properties in their names, and they incorporated in 1922. And then um, in the mid-1920s, they expanded into the parking garage business, which if you think about it, is actually a lot less trouble than running boarding houses because you're just, people are just parking their cars, um, not dealing with so much drama as we saw in the, more, in the Stevens block. Um, the, the sisters, uh, they owned the Rialto Garage on East Galena, which was a large building um, connected to the, the, the Rialto Theater. Um, and in 1927, they renovated the Edison Hotel, which is on East Mercury, and they renovated that into um, a parking garage as well. Um, and when they died, um, several articles referencing their properties included their, um, mentioned that they were pioneer businesswomen of Anaconda. So I just think it's significant and so interesting that a lot of women ran boarding houses that's not news to anyone, but there are quite a few women that I am learning about, still learning about, um, that um, they own these buildings. They sometimes built them from the ground up, and they were running real estate investment businesses. Um, the Kelly House is one example. The Kelly Sisters um, ran a large hotel in early day Butte. Um, the Leonard, Curtis, and Hamilton Hotels all three of them beautiful um, buildings that are, um, I think all, the Hamilton is gone, but the Leonard and the Curtis are still there and they're wonderful buildings and those were run by Mamie Leary. Um, the Palmy Block um, ran, um, had a dry cleaner and a dye works in it and many, many boarding house room, rooms run by French sisters, the Palmy sisters. The Dykeman Hotel also run by two women for about 40 years, and that, that one was also um, built from the ground up. And the Kenwood, Marie and Ganella Brecky, or Breck, um, built the building and ran it for many years. And the O'Rourke building um, is connected to a building that um, Mary O'Rourke's husband built, but they Mary built this building after he died, and she managed it with her daughter for 25 years, and then her daughter lived there and managed it for another 20 years after that. So really interesting um, uh, coming across all of these um, women land landlords and real estate investors that had a fair amount of impact on the architecture and the economy of um, uh, Butte. And um, next we move over to Helena. Another interesting home I recently wrote about um, brings attention to the African-American community in Helena. Uh, we never had a large population here, but it was there, and there is a lot to learn about it. Um, the house itself has a long and interesting history, um, and I was not able to say much at all about Helena's African-American community in it. Um, just to give you a quick background on the house, um, it was one of Helena's earlier homes, built in 1873 for lawyer and U.S. Land Office, regi land office Register Loren Lorenzo Lyman. Um, this was his first, or sorry, it was Helena's uh, at the time. Rodney Street was Helena's like fashionable neighborhood, and it was also considered the quiet part of town. Um, but the Lymans didn't stay long. They um, sold everything uh, a few years later in 1875 and they sold to Samuel and Lavinia Neal. Um, Samuel died suddenly in 1882, and Lavinia moved away, but she kept the house for rental income. And, um, but by the early 1890s, Helena's west side was actually becoming the most fashionable neighborhood, so a lot of people were starting to move away. And in 1898, um, African-American businesswoman Alice Palmer rented the house and she lived downstairs with her mother and five children, and she rented the upstairs rooms to African-American tenants. 
If that wasn't enough of a long history, um, in 1930, Associate Montana Supreme Court Justice Sam C. Ford bought the house. And of course, Ford became Montana governor in 1941. He didn't sell the house, he moved down the street to the governor's mansion, um, but kept this house and, and rented it to tenants. Um, but he was done as governor in 1949 and he moved back in. Um, they didn't have any kids at home at the time, so um, Sam and his wife, Mary, uh, lived downstairs and they rented the upstairs rooms to boarders. And uh, even though Sam died in 1961, Mary continued living here um, until 1972, renting the upstairs rooms again to um, widows. But what I wanna draw attention to is, um, that I couldn't fit on the sign, is Alice Palmer and Helena's um, African-American community. Though Alice um, only rented this house and ran it as a boarding house for three years, she was a significant bu business owner in the county um, and her tenants, um, her tenants in the building um, give a snapshot of Helena's African American community. Um, Alice may have been born enslaved in Kentucky in 1853. Um, she moved with her family to North Dakota in the 1870s. And in the 1880s, she um, had five children with um, William Palmer, who was an English born Caucasian. Um, the couple never married, um, and they moved, or that we could find, they have never married. Um, they moved to Helena in 1886, um, and by 1898, William had disappeared. He either died or left town. Um, and so uh, Alice was living uh, in this house with 10 other people, including her mother, her son, four daughters, a nephew, and three young male boarders. And the Palmers um, and the boarders who lived here represent a microcosm um, of the African-American community at the time. Um, her son, Arthur, was a steward in an all-white men's club called the Lambs Club. Her nephew, James Johnson, had a job whitewashing or calcimining, as they called it. Her daughters were still in school, but her boarders, Henry Williams, was a janitor, but he had been a Buffalo soldier uh, fighting in the Indian Wars in the 1870s. Gus Mason worked as a porter and then manager of the Manhattan Club, an African-American social club in town. He was known as the life of the party and an excellent entertainer. David Cannoli was a veteran of the Spanish-American War, serving with the 24th Inter Infantry Company D, stationed at Fort Harrison. He worked as a hotel porter. And James Howard, he was a family friend from North Dakota, and he was also a hotel porter. Um, so the house sold in 1902, and Alice moved um, to a house that's now, it's not there anymore, it would be on the Carroll College campus, um, but she remained active in uh, business, and with her son, um, Arthur, they actually homesteaded 80 acres of land near Lincoln in their, um, probably after 1910, and on that land, they built 22 tourist cabins, and for the next 30 years, they operated those cabins, catering to African-American travelers along Highway 200. Um, she died in 1936, and Arthur, her son, continued uh, running the cabins until 1951. So a long time institution, those cabins were um, uh, up near Lincoln. And, but sadly, there are only a few other signs in Helena um, and uh, throughout the rest of the state that, um, that talk about African Americans here. Um, but luckily, our um, wonderful historian, Kate Hampton, who works in the State Historic Preservation Office, for the past uh, more than 10 years, she's been working on documenting Montana's African American heritage. Um, and you can find um, loads of information um, on the website. If you Google Montana's African American Heritage Places, um, you can learn, uh, find a treasure trove of information on the African American community. All right, so I have to tell a story, a ghost story, because it's close to Halloween. And I actually have two, and they're both, no, they're not both from Helena, one's from Helena. And usually I shy away from telling ghost stories, especially about Helena, because this is Ellen Baumler's territory, and you all know Dr. 
Ellen is the queen of Helena history and of ghost history, but I think she would think it was okay that I'm talking about a ghost story um, because I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Reader's Alley, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, but uh, I feel like I can tell this story because I worked in Reader's Alley for 10 years before I um, came over to work here at MHS. Um, and I also worked directly with a colleague who, ha who experienced the Reader's Alley Stonehouse ghost directly. So there are three National Register signs if you walk up and down Reader's Alley, and none of them talk about ghosts. Um, they all talk about uh, the pertinent information, the good information about Lewis Reader. He was a P Pennsylvania brick mason, and he built um, many buildings in Reader's Alley. They're all kind of connected, but some they're actually separate, built at separate times. Um, but he, he, he had about 35 brick and stone boarding house units that he built between 1875 and 1884. And the one up at the top of the alley, um, the stone bunkhouse held four uh, tenement units in it, and it was later nicknamed the Stone House. And the National Register sign talks about George and Laura Duchesne. They were property managers of that building by 1920, and they made their home in the front unit. Uh, Laura was a well-known breeder of canaries, and she filled the tiny apartment with her songbirds. Um, the Duchesneys rented the, the small dwellings and tenements almost exclusively to single men. And... Unfortunately, Reader's Alley was um, badly damaged in the 1935 earthquake, and many tenants were displaced. And by the 1960s, uh, the alley had become increasingly dilapidated, and, and talk of demolition was coming up about what to do with the buildings. But luckily, there were three women um, who recognized uh, the significance of the alley, and um, they bought it, and they saved it. And it's a, that's a great preservation story. Um, but, um, so after they saved it, uh, from the late 60s to the early 2000s, the Alley Buildings held various galleries, studios, gift shops, and restaurants. When I moved to Helena in 2002, um, the Stonehouse Building was called the Stonehouse Restaurant, and it was considered a fancy restaurant. It was a great restaurant, good, good place to go separate, celebrate a, a special occasion. Um, and then in 2008, I moved into this um, building uh, with the Montana Preservation Alliance, and I um, probably spent thousands of hours in this building, including at weird hours of the day, and I never witnessed anything weird. I witnessed a lot of stuff, but I never had any feeling of um, that there was anything creepy going on, although it was perpetually dark inside because the walls are stone. But I never saw anything. But then in 2014, I, um, I, we had a new employee, Matt Morgan, uh, was our uh, restoration architect, and he was working in the building alone. No one else was there, and he was um, sitting in his office typing away and suddenly heard the sounds of many, many birds chirping. Um, and he's a big outdoorsman, and so he went outside to see what flock of birds had landed on the roof or what they were doing outside the door because his desk was quite close to the front door. He went out to look for the sound of the birds, and he couldn't find anything. He didn't think much of it, but he was talking to his sister a few days later and told her the same story, and she just kind of looked at him and went a little bit pale, and she pulled Ellen Baumler's book off the shelf, Haunted Helena, and proceeded to tell him the story of Laura Duchesne and her songbirds. So it turns out that Laura enjoyed having birds, um, but there was a dual purpose to her birds. They, um, she would put them in, they, they were in cages, and when her moonshine was ready, she would put the cages outside to let local residents know that the moonshine was ready. And if anybody asked, they were just there to buy birds from her. So there was that story, but there was it's more to that. Um, so Laura Duchesne died in 1933, and her husband let the birds free in the house um, to give one last goodbye to her. 
and um, before her burial. And um, after that, Laura's husband eventually found new homes for the birds, and the birds were gone from the building. But when the building became a restaurant in the 1990s, more than one wait, wait, waitress would, would talk about hearing strange bird sounds in the building. And one waitress, Michaela Crawford, was closing up the stone house one night, and she heard a bird. And not wanting to leave a bird in the building overnight, uh, she went to go find it. And as she got closer to the sound, she heard more chirping and more wings flapping. And she went all the way to the front door where the sound was coming from, and she found nothing. So. Um, so Matt had the same experience. Um, he didn't know anything about the birds before he moved into the building. Um, and so I thought that was an interesting story. Um, both Matt and I were kind of skeptics, you know, we had talked about like hearing about ghosts in Reader's Alley and we both kind of were like, eh, never, never saw anything. But now we um, both changed our minds after that. <laughs> And one last story, uh, back over to Butte. We'll bookend the presentation with Butte. Um, my colleague Martha, Martha could actually come up here and give the story of this sign. Uh, Martha wrote this sign and she had a ball writing it because there were so many good stories associated with it. The occupants were so interesting, but she was really sad to leave um, quite a bit, quite a few stories on the cutting room floor. Um, to paraphrase the sign, uh, uh, in 1885, dentist Robert Todd and his wife Emma moved into this newly constructed Italian-style home. In 1886, the Todds sold to Jesse and Elizabeth Wharton, who lived here with their three children until 1909. Jesse managed the Butte Electric Railway for copper magnate William A. Clark. In 1898, he defended the railway's practice of transporting ore down Montana Street, and I just love this line. While his neighbors complained that the dreadful ore cars kept them from sleeping, Jesse, in a newspaper article, insisted that the noise of the ore cars has a most invigorating effect and lulls me to sleep every night. It is one happy dream for me. <laughs> I love that. So, but Jesse Wharton was not only snarky, he, um, was best known uh, for creating both Clark Park and Columbia Gardens, which was, of course, um, Montana's best love amusement park. So that was the story uh, of uh, Jesse Wharton and the, um, the first owners of the house that made it onto the sign, which, of course, those are great stories. But there was a ghost story. There's two stories associated with this house that we didn't get to put on the sign. The reason that the Todds lived here so briefly um, was related uh, or <laughs> illuminated in a news article that appears to be written actually by Jesse Wharton and um, telling the story of his haunted house. So he, uh, Jesse Wharton notes that Todd's, the Todd's sold him the house for a very cheap price and he just couldn't figure out why, but he took it and he took the deal anyway. Um, and he soon figured out why he got the home so cheaply shortly after moving in because each night at the stroke of midnight, they would hear footsteps moving from room to room. They tested out all of the, they tried to investigate a, a, a logical reason. Um, and so they, for the, for the sounds, and they, they moved about from room to room. They would sit upstairs and listen. They would sit downstairs, but always at midnight, it sounded like someone was moving around from room to room. Um, so finally, after months of trying to figure out and months of fear and concern of, you know, maybe our house is actually haunted, um, uh, Jesse Wharton went outside at midnight. And of course, he figured out right away that the sound was the sound of dynamite blasts coming from the Ganyan mine nearby. And they were successive blasts, so they rattled the house and it made it sound like um, someone was running from room to room. So there was no ghost, but Wharton made the news again a few years later in 1898 when, oh, I got another slide, a thief stole, stole his trousers. Uh, <laughs> the article exclaimed, a daring sneak thief entered the residence of J.R. Wharton's and deliberately stole the railroad manager's $12 trousers from beside his bed. 
the pants had $4.55 inside. And Wharton is quoted as saying he didn't miss the loss of the money so much, but the disappearance of his pants caused him a great inconvenience because he was unable to leave the house until a kindly neighbor could um, loan him a pair of pants so that he could go to a clothing store and buy a new pair of pants. Um, aside from this article not really being newsworthy, um, it was... <laughs> I thought, and Martha thought too, that it was quite odd that um, Mr. Wharton did not have a second pair of pants. <laughs> Someone who could afford a $12 pants might have had a $6 pair for the weekend or for working in the garden or um, so, uh, <laughs> or maybe his wife. Or I, I, he didn't live alone. I'm, I'm kind of puzzled about how he couldn't get out. Maybe he just wanted the morning off that day. I'm not sure. So, um, but that is unfortunately all the news I have that is not fit to print. Uh, next time you read one of our signs, just know that there's a lot more to learn uh, behind the scenes, uh, the backstories of all these signs. And um, I encourage you to visit historicmt.org um, if you do find a property that you do want to learn a little bit more about. Thank you. Any questions? Kirby. I, I could not find anything on her. <laughs> Sad, yeah. Bruce. Mm, the sign pro program definitely started in 1990. I think Marcella Walter um, was there at, at uh, the SHPO when they started that. I, I, Mar Martha might know the first sign. Um, so it, the, when the sign program started, they started with a contractor. Actresses. Actress with those very, very first signs. Um, so when we say 1,800 plus, it's because there's just probably some out there that we can't, you know, tell you about. Yeah. And you can tell some of the very early signs were shorter than the ones that you see now. They're like 100 words. Or, or, yeah, they're very short. So. Do more cities have more signs than others? Or? Yeah, they are ranked, actually, on the Historic Montana website. If you bring up, if you, like, click on the tags, I think, the, the, the term tags, um, the Butte has the most by far, like over 300. Um, and then I think it may be Helena and Butte, or Helena and uh, Missoula after that, or Kalispell, Kalispell. I'm looking at Martha because she might know different. <laughs> some, some cities who are really small have a disproportionate number of signs for their size. So like every building is four sites. Like and Virginia like, City. You know, or Virginia yeah. City. There, there's certain ones that are that go on. Yeah. yeah. Lori. Uh, like, I know some towns are more accessible to read around uh, July. They're all on the building, and I don't want to find out what's on the site. I know. We definitely try to direct people to put them out near the sidewalk where people can read them. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control over where people put the signs. We do dictate that they put them outside, um, which there are still some, especially business owners, that put them inside. Um, but yeah, it's unfortunate because they need to be where people can read them. <laughs> it, w yeah, we, we ask them to put them out where people can read them, and but beyond that, we can't really enforce what they're actually doing. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, if I don't, yeah, I would not want to put it on my house because I definitely wouldn't want to encourage people hanging out on my porch. It would be kind of weird. So. <laughs> yeah, that's odd. Anybody else? And some people do ask me, just in case you're wondering, a lot of people do ask me the question of whether the sign, having a sign means that you... 
uh, can't do certain, make certain changes to your house or that there are restrictions on your property and it, it actually has nothing to do with the sign. The sign is just a, a nice um, place-based education program that we have. It's the listing on the National Register that may in some very um, not common cases, some local municipalities at the local level, they may have like a design review process or um, a permit process that may affect it if you're, um, what you do to your house. But it's actually, in most cases, it, there are no restrictions. Historicmontana.org has it all mapped out. It's okay. right on the, the front page. The first thing that comes up is a map with all these little pins, 1,800 pins. So you can zoom in on that map and um, and just navigate around that way, or you can also search by property name or property town. Um, so there are a million ways to find the property you want um, on that site. In fact, you can, if you know the owner's name, um, if it comes up in the sign description, you can put that in the search box and it'll find it. So, yep. That's all. All right, thank you. Thank you.